My list of reasons not to commit suicide. One, there was no hair in Welch Rabbit. Two, there was no meat in 20th century meat, meat, mincemeat. Three, recess is held in high esteem by kindergarteners and Supreme Court justices. Four, the voice of Flipper is a kookaburra. Five, the kookaburra lives in an old gum tree. Six, the gum tree is eucalyptus. Seven, there is no stomach in a duck-billed platypus. Eight, the principal is never a pal. Nine, I smoke cigarettes in the art room while the rest of the class pencil sketches signs of budding spring, overfilled dumpsters, and pendant rain. Ten, my big sister left home when she was 14. Eleven, I saw her in front of the school five years later. Twelve, she shared two pieces of advice with me. One, no underwear is cleaner than dirty underwear. <laughs> two, a hooker shower of powder and perfume is cleaner than all the dirt Ted Turner portrays, trust me. Thirteen, she always talks in circles, even before tracks, polka dotted her arms, marked her bulky thighs, separated her toes. Fourteen, her mouse brown hair is too thin to hold a rubber band. Fifteen, my mom cries during her afternoon soap operas. Sixteen, my dad claimed I was conceived during late night reruns of the Rat Patrol. Seventeen, my dad claims he was conceived in a woman's prison. Eighteen, my best friend moved away before she had time to sleep with my boyfriend. Nineteen, I sleep naked every night with the windows open. Twenty, the folded inserts of pretty boys from various, ma from various gossip magazines are taped to my ceiling. Twenty-one, I watch them watch me. Twenty-two, sometimes they drool. 23, I have baby blue eyes. 24, I sleep with them open. <laughs> this next poem, I have a, um, a series of poems on feelings, and this is one of them. And that's a feeling of disputation. I revel in white starch petticoats with scalloped eyelet trim, a blue gross grain ribbon pulled from the hem is left homeless in a dark closet, stomped on by black western boots, the, uh, stomped on by black western dance boots of cowhide with no synthetic undersides like vegan underwear, a pattern of forget-me-nots drizzles like feathers that fall from peacock tails, wings of swan or baby stork. When a celestial sphere of time clock bombs, mechanical watches, blueprint boxes of fingerprints, fingerprints of peppermints, peppermints of diamond mines, mines of mines of mines of time explode in gardens where feathers grow from angel's hair, pillow ticking and downy quilts. Feathers grow from flightless birds, nameless shame, dirty needles left on floors. Woven feathers, knitted leather, knitted letters in fishnet socks, woven letters in garter belts suspended from catacombs in poets, a poet's laid to rest. I see flashing cerulean neon. I hear a midget tell a lie. I smell misgivings of suspicions. My lips in truth part against the lamplit sky. I taste strange, I taste more. I taste 4th of July. I open my legs one at a time, a resentful moisture flows, pool and hair and desk, mace and mask, on Egyptian sheets, while below in the streets is laid a century of unadulterated snow. Right. She thought she heard a voice. See my girl in her hospital gown, in the lockdown ward of beds? Beds crawling over each other, talking to whomever listens. Pretend, pretend to swallow the pills, white and yellow. Slip them in the pocket under your tongue. The boys let her use her tongue in ways she kept secret. She imagined a gown she would have worn to prom. It would have been yellow eyelid with French lace. 
She saw herself sprawled against the bed in the motel on the second floor with a shared bath. Everyone pretending to be adults without talking, only groans, barely heard. He left her talking to herself after placing a red pill under her tongue. They found her nodding the cord. She pretended she didn't hear the knock, pretended to zip the gum, pretended to discard the stains on the sheets, beds pushed against walls, faded to yellowish hues, reminders of adults, a boy's too yellow to cry their pain. They left her talk into walls to sink to doors. Under bed she hid, afraid her tongue would share her pain. Alone, now gowned without zippers, cords cut. She pretended to swallow the pill, pretended to smile, pretended to believe the sun's orange and yellow rays would fill her inside out, disrobing her gown back to front. No one listened. They talked. She watched their lips, their teeth, their tongues speaking noises, writing words and symbols and circled in her bed, in her bed, under the bed, make the bed, make the bed rock, make the bed squeak, make the bed groan, pretend. Pretend there's a pocket under your tongue. Pocket the pills, red, white, yellow walls, yellow blankets, yellow heads, yellow tongues that never stop. Stop the tongues that wag, tongues that talk, as you slip out of your bed, out of your gown without cords. A cordless gown in a ward of beds, all talking, screaming yellow, yellow in shame. Pretend and zip the gown. Give us your time. This, this next poem I always feel like I need to say, um, if you're offended, you might be offended, sorry, but um, I wrote this poem after I heard an NPR report, uh, an NPR interview, and it was with a woman who worked for the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, and she was on the committee that decided when new words were to be put into the dictionary, and she explained that whole process. Um, and she reflected back on a couple of years ago when it was decided that the word F-bomb was going to be put into the dictionary. And that was when she said they just got tons of backlash on. So if you're offended, you can blame it on NPR and the dictionary. <laughs> the, day, the day after F-bomb is added to the dictionary. My husband yells at me today after he says fuck and I say fuck come silence, during which time it is stupid to say fuck again. So he says what the fuck and stupid fuck. I say what the fuck, nothing stupid fuck. But it turns out okay. He sits on the couch, watches stupid fucking monster trucks drive over log piles, through med puddles, then clicks to made for TV fishing as if fishing isn't stupid enough on its own, unless you're fishing out of town in a dark bar at the end of the street, looking for a good fuck where your wife can't find you. Yeah. Unless she's looking for a good fuck, or just a dark bar, a fucking good dark bar, with a pool table, cold beer, loud jukebox, cigarette machine, mostly Marlboro Reds, mostly rednecks who know a lot about fucking, a little about sex, and nothing about making love. Unless you consider a long ride in a pickup with a six-pack of cans, a shotgun in the rack, one headlight out, one hard dick out, and one young girl who says yes, because the moon is full and Willie is crooning, little things I should have done, I just never took the time, but you were always on my mind. A coyote howls, the wind whispers, Across the hood blows bits of rest she takes for fairy dust as he releases into her. Wow. <laughs> the one you fall in love with. I watch him filter sterno through damp paper towels. My eyes focus on the drip, drip, drip into a metal can. The can that once held dinner for calico, missing a hind paw. His burly hands shake, drink. Agitation is a natural part of his day. My legs and cross, dirt between my toes, streaks towards my ankles. I hold the can, 
My top lip inhales. My throat swells. It erupts a fiery spew and returns past charred tonsils and it pools on a parched tongue. I said drink. My thin lips purse. I swallow hard. I squint the burn into a blur. That's the way you do it, baby. Drink. Drink it all up. Change, change the mood up here a little bit. Um, anybody do yoga out there? You do yoga, this might be um, My drishti is a spinning top. I am not a yogi except three hours a week. Flower, the 20 something blonde yogi, bun atop her head, balances a subtle energy clearing. Her soft belly, arms, legs, and fingers are festooned with butterflies, purple swirls, lotus blossoms, streams of green and blue. She naps in downward dog. Except three hours a week, I check schedules. One less away at, volunteer schedules, work schedules, my husband's ride schedule. I schedule others on nature walks, to work on time, to school, with homework to violin lessons, strumming notes that taste like bobbin for sour green apples. I teach the necessities of time and place, manners and goals and grades. Flower teaches inversions. Her feet above her heart, a supported shoulder stand with legs straight, toes towards her forehead. Her throat and tongue are soft, bringing harmony to body and mind. Flowers, Chaturuga, and Suptavarsana, open heart and crow's pose are a perfect balance of holding and letting go. I let go in child's pose. Resting is a good thing. I am scheduled to leave before Shavasana. Except three hours a week, I am a force of nature. Not the red rose blooming sweet nectar snacks for hummingbirds along the white picket fence nature. Not the pale green inchworm crawling on the blade of forest green grass nature, but rather one that rips through a community, unsettles trees by roots, upheaves landfills, sending waves of rotten fish, spoiled beef, hamster cage shavings through the lower atmosphere, casting thunderous hope on town meetings, family discussions, city ordinances, dry neighborhood swimming pools. Except three hours a week, she's the one who will get it done, as written in my high school yearbook, when my daughter asks for home-baked whoopie pies for tomorrow's bake sale. My son needs his sports physical yesterday. My husband only wants me to stop, to linger, compliment him for something, something specific to show the respect a male craves after he's mowed the lawn, Explain the political climate. Remember to tell me he thought of me as he drove past the florist on his way to somewhere. He wants me to compliment him after I have a chance to look into the details of the upcoming men's golf tournament advertised at the club. Flower lights a bird-shaped beeswax candle with a slight jasmine scent. The flame murmurs a cool resonance. From anger comes delusion. From delusion, loss of memory. From loss of memory, the destruction of discrimination. From the destruction of discrimination, one perishes. Like fruit, I whisper back. Perishes like fruit. But I'm a yogi. In Tandasada, my ten toes are up, rooting four corners of each foot to earth. I elongate my spine. Tuck my chin ever so slightly and turn my palms forward while I pull my shoulders down my back. In that balance of push and pull, I realize I have confused perish with ripen. I whisper from my mountain, ripens like fruit. Flower flows from mountain to eagle, turns airplane to tree. A small well in the bird flickers the flame. Are, sometimes I think they're about death and sometimes I think they're about life, so you can decide. <laughs> Yesterday I was texted my ex-husband had died with no details leading me to wonder. If he died on the side of the road, 
after he was thrown from his motorcycle because he lost focus to watch an eagle swoop and attack a lesser bird in the air, causing him to lean too far into a blind curve somewhere past 80 miles per hour. All the skills he had acquired in lieu of relationship and family, home and tenderness, were now consumed by the hot pavement, so that he died twice. If he died after square dancing with an eddy, losing his pattern in the cold snow melt, his life jacket out of reach, while his body tumbled down the waterfall as his mouth and eyes opened, taking in bubbles that guised his limbs into his final baptism, where he could no longer distinguish heaven from earth, azure sky from blue sea foam, freedom from a life of shields. Then he died with no new clarity. With no details, I am left to wonder if his thoughts still raced, feeding his insomnia with vehicle issues, relationship conflicts, political disharmony, and multiple non-sequitur conversations of more problems, while his unfilled close hand refilled prescription bookmarked the Johnny Cash Folsom Prison middle finger image in a special edition of Life magazine because he never felt the slow slope of his downward spiral, even after he filed for a divorce when he shook his head and said, this is not easy, I don't know if it's the right thing to do, I don't know what to do. If he died quietly alone in bed, under his favorite secondhand quilt, following a night of cold beer and a microwave Salisbury steak dinner, while watching an action-packed rerun, pausing it to pee and pet the cat, that slept during the day on the lazy boy, which was never out of recline, so that he died a complete circle. An hour into the repast. Someone asks me, how you doing, honey? I scarcely shake my head. Mom never liked crowds. Even as a preschooler at the food bank, I place hold. She waits on the curb, smoking a cigarette, waiting for me to signal for her ID. My bag splits, sending apples already bruised, rolling along the damp wood floor. At the pharmacy once, after leaving the clinic with a boy with blonde hair vomits into the garbage bag, scabs on his legs, elbows, earlobes, eating one so at a time, she waits outside near the dumpster. Someone says, bite the bullet. Someone else laughs. Somewhere I hear we're running on ice. Instead of one bullet, I wish she had taken pills. Lots of pills to kill them. To kill them with her. In the dining room, a pill for Dave when he kicked in the plaster of the pill and paint. In the hallway, a pill where Pete practiced pulling his pocket knife. One pill for the stench of smoke ingrained in the faded shades that never fully roll up. Two pills for Paul after he dragged the washing machine to the yard, hooking the hoses up to the car. A shot of whiskey instead for Mira Mike to wash down the last line of cocaine. One pill for Tim, who put locks on all our doors. In the kitchen, coffee for the cop who knocks on all the doors and knows us all by name. Another cup of coffee for the butt burns everywhere. Through the cold nights, a pill when Steve may be asleep on the porch just because. Out of the purse, two pills for the bill collector's visits. A different pill for Lou, the loudmouth bigot who burnt all my homework in third grade. And the last pill for the backwoods talking white knight. Someone hands me a sandwich. You need to eat something. I don't know if it's turkey or ham. Two more poems. Um, but before we can just again thank you everyone for being here and again putting these together. This next poem is another one of the poems from um, my collections on poems on feelings. This one. Thoughts are not feelings. Between blankets and sleep, sleep and death. Rolls hard red apples, day old bread, liverwurst, fingerless gloves, frayed shoelaces, nine pregnancies, 
six slide berth, red brick walls, tarnished forks with bent tines, and a topless jelly jar where flies procreate. My thighs wake too cold. Not snow cold, children pray for with carrot nosed snowmen sledding down hills. Not ice cold cubes clanging against the sides of a sparkling tumbler, swishing an orange rind, maraschino cherry, barrel aged rye, and a sugar cube. Not chills nor sneezes. Between blankets and sleep, sleep and death, climbs carpenter ants, carpet baggers. Beggars with dogs, blind men with seeing eye dogs, dogs with dog walkers, with cats with claws that scratch the skin of the street cleaners who wake brooms in the early morn. My thighs wake too loud. Not loud like an 80s metal concert with mosh pits, sweaty armpits, armed security in the pits. Not loud like psychedelic glow-in-the-dark peace signs hung in reefer-infused basements drowning out gas lawnmowers and the neighborhood block parties of complacent suburbia. My thighs wake to election results before mail-in votes are counted. They wake to police sirens across the river that redirect traffic from the scuba divers who rake the bottom in search. My thighs wake to mustaches in ancient cedar trees and raccoon families running across rooftops. Between blankets and sleep, sleep and death, between perennial country gardens and koi ponds, blueberry festivals and hapless marriages, plastic unicorns and unemployment checks, grilled cheese sandwiches and white water eddies, my thighs sleep between death and blankets. <laughs> Reports from the eye of Judas Hurricane to the urban barnyard. I am the one who understands how today buries yesterday behind the picket fence before the whitewash is completely dried. I am the one who understands how today splits the universe into vintage cars of tomorrow and how as you drift to sleep in the barn red wheelbarrow and before I dream in the pinhole camera, you ask who are the monsters who live in the dishwasher, lick the plates, clean and slurp the soup bowls, hone the knives and fill the coffee cups, then nestle with the whole cloves and the lithium salts to wait for a whirlwind to toss the salad of living lettuce and legacies across the dining room table. Yes, I am the one who can explain how caissons go rolling along, how rolling pins glide over marble, how you lost your marbles in the sewer, how they fell from the black felt bag hanging off the handlebars as of your stingray while you raised your arms and legs yelling, Wee! I'm the one who knows the name of each firework as it illuminates the sky. Hardy red geraniums, ice snowball, lost diamond necklace, long neck giraffe. I'm the one who can explain how how a goldfish beats death when flushed down a toilet. How to pearl, pearl, knit a sweater standing in the dark on one foot. And how to rock to sleep a crying infant long lost in an open meadow. Wow.